I wouldn't pray for us if I were you. I think, yeah. Uh, anyway, we're, uh, we're excited about uh, what God is doing here. And just we really feel honored to be a part of this, of this family. Um, November 4th of 2000 was when Beth and I said our I do's to one another. And I want you to know that I have never um, struggled with an assurance of my marriage. Uh, that might sound like a weird way to put it, but I've never, never questioned um, throughout the years if, if I was married. I knew I was married. Uh, there, uh, there have been a couple of times when I had to stop and, and I asked myself, do, Gary, do you even remember the vows that you said? And, uh, but even that, that lack of knowing what I actually said on that day has not caused me to wonder if, if I'm married. Anybody... Kind of, has anybody honestly forgotten what your vows were? I'm not saying that you, yeah, nobody's admitting it if you're sitting next to your spouse. Okay, great, I'm the only one. Um, I'm available for lunch today if anybody wants to. Uh, I, uh, I've been to some weddings where I've, I, I've seen the bride and groom there, and I've seen the groom with a, just so much passion and conviction share his heart as he said his vows. And it's kind of led me to think, well, I don't remember that I really... I don't, I don't think I cried like he did at my wedding. Um, did I do something wrong? You know, should I have been a little bit more emotional? But that's not led me to think, well, I wasn't very emotional. Am I married? I, I know that I'm married. Now, those, those analogies kind of sound a little weird when it comes to marriage. But let me tell you, as, as assured as I am of my marriage, there were several years in my life where I struggled with an assurance of my salvation. I struggled in my assurance of my relationship with my Heavenly Father. And, and as weird as it is, some of those parallels were the same. I wondered, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what I prayed. I mean, I was only like eight years old, and it's been a long time. Did I really mean what I said? Um, did I know what I was really getting myself into? I, I've heard stories of other people talking about how they gave their life to Christ and, and they would talk about how it was just this emotional moment and such radical life change. And I, I kind of look back at mine and go, I, I don't think I experienced that. Does that, am I, am I saved? Am I not? Does anybody kind of experience that maybe over the years? And so this assurance of salvation is something that really, it kind of fueled fear in my life. I, as a young child, I remember being scared to death. Have anybody, has anybody ever seen, it came out in the 70s, the, the movie Left Behind, okay, it, where there's like this electric razor that's, that's rattling around in the sink because someone was raptured and everybody else got left behind. I was, I was standing in my kitchen, in the kitchen talking to my mom as I was a young child and a, a young boy, and I turn, and I'm doing something at the counter, but I'm still talking to my mom. And I turn back around, and my mom wasn't there. And my first thought was, I missed the rapture. <laughs> I'm terrified, you know. And so it caused me to kind of, kind of call out in a frantic voice for my mom. Mom, are you, you know, mom. And she kind of rushes back into the kitchen trying to figure out what, was, what I was so, you know, worried about. And I saw my mom, and I thought, oh, my goodness. She missed the rapture too. And no, I'm just kidding. No, no, I saw her and instantly I was like, oh, okay. You know, and she's looking at me just like I'm crazy. But fear dominated so much of my life. And it, and it took several years to realize that the gift of salvation that I received, um, and I want to emphasize that I receive. Salvation is a free gift of God. It's not of our works. It's not something that we earn. We come to the Father through Jesus, and we accept his gift of salvation, his gift of forgiveness for us. Um, when we understand really what this is, this gift of salvation, God wants us to breathe easy, assured of our salvation. It's God's desire for us to breathe easy, not to be motivated by fear. You know, oh, did I say the prayer right? Am I, have I lived up to my end of the bargain? Is, is there something that I'm missing? Was, it, was I supposed to be as emotionally driven as that person was? No, it, it's, it's a work that Jesus did on the cross for us, and I've received that. We're, we're walking through this, this book of, of Romans, this chapter in Romans, chapter 8, 
And I think we can all agree it is a really big chapter. There is so much that Paul packs into this. And to be honest with you, it has really made me nervous to teach on this. When Glenn said, you know, hey, jump in with me on this series, I'm like, let's pick something a little easier. <laughs> I'll jump in on the next series maybe. But um, in this, really what has taken place, a, a, kind of a, a sweeping overview of Romans, at the beginning of this book of Romans, Paul has been talking about how um, we are broken and we are separated from God by our sins, but we're reunited with him as we pray and invite Christ into our life. And then he begins to talk about in Romans 5, and he carries it on in Romans 8, he begins to affirm in us how we can be assured of that salvation that God offers us. And so it's, it's not something that he gives us and then he expects us to, uh, to, to continue to work and to live in fear. He really wants us to breathe easy in understanding that we are his child. So kind of knowing this overarching theme, it doesn't come as a surprise to realize that Romans 8 mentions the Holy Spirit more per verse than any other section of the, of the scriptures. And the reason it mentions the Holy Spirit so much, one of the reasons is because the Holy Spirit works within us to assure us of our salvation, if indeed we are a child of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to help us to breathe easier. Now, I use that phrase, breathe easier, on purpose, because you may remember from last week, Glenn was talking about this word spirit is pneuma in the Greek, and it can be translated as word, as, as wind, or as breath. A pneumatic tire is a tire filled with air. When you have pneumonia, it impacts your lungs. It impacts your breathing. In the Old Testament, the spirit is still associated with wind and breath. The, the, the Hebrew word is ruach. And you can't even pronounce ruach without it sounding real breathy. It's a word that you wouldn't want to say to someone if you've not brushed your teeth this morning, okay? <laughs> and we, we have this word ruach, and, and it, it first appears in the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-2. And the Spirit of God, the breath of God, the ruach of God hovered above the waters. And the, that theme of breathing is carried over into Genesis 2. God forms Adam from the dust of the earth, and he breathes life into his nostrils. And this breathing is not just animating his physical self. We understand that, that God is animating this being that is created in his image. He is animating um, Adam's soul. And so this, this theme of breathing is carried all throughout the Bible. God's breath, his Holy Spirit... And the Father wants us to breathe easier, knowing that we are his child. So I want us to, to look at this passage, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. If you have your Bible, open up to that. If not, it's going to be on the screens. And if you're Suzanne, close your eyes and uh, just quote it to yourself. Was that not amazing last week? Yeah. Again, I'm like, am I saved? I can't quote Romans 8. No, I'm just kidding. I was just, um, Romans 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ... We are heirs of God's glory, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So the question that I want you to ask yourself throughout uh, these next few moments as we look at this text, can you breathe easy assured that you are a child of God? Can you breathe easy assured that, um, that Jesus' work on the cross is sufficient for you? Or is there some type of a fear that motivates you? Um, as, you, as you walk through a, a typical day. I want us to be able to, at, at the end of, this, of our time together, I want us to breathe easier with the knowledge of our inclusion in God's family for those of us that have, have made that decision. Or maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe today is your day where you become a member, become adopted into God's family. And, and because of that, you are, are breathing easier. Now, let me say up front, before we get into some of the specifics of this, 
What Paul is doing is he is giving us a, a description, not a prescription. He is describing for us um, what this is to be a child of God and, and why we can breathe easier. He is not prescribing a list of things that, that God's kind of placed on our shoulders and say, okay, now if you really want to be a child of mine, then you better do this. Um, it is a description. In other words, uh, for a prescription, that would be a way of earning God's favor in order to receive the badge of sonship. Um, but this uh, describes salvation as being a gift from God that we receive by faith and we cannot work for or earn the ability uh, to live according to the Spirit. It's not a prescription of things that you must do and earn that leave you breathless. It's a description of one who is resting in the life-giving breath of God. So with that in mind, I want us to consider four ways, uh, four reasons why a true child of God will be able to breathe easier as we understand and we accept and we are assured of this gift that he has offered to us. Back in verse 14, um, it says, uh, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Um, you will breathe easier as one who is led by the Spirit of God. As a child, you will breathe easier led by the Spirit. Now, this word led um, is, is important for us to kind of grasp what this means. And there are three kind of brief definitions that I want to give you for it, but they all um, mean the same thing. Um, it means to lead by accompanying, to attach to oneself as an attendant, to move or to impel of forces and influences on the mind. In other words, it's, it's inward. And that's the thing I want you to understand. A child of God is led by an internal pull of the Spirit. An internal pull of the Spirit. So let's kind of read these definitions back into this, this verse. And maybe this will, uh, will help you grasp it a little bit better. Uh, for all who are accompanied by the Spirit of God... Are children of God. For all who have been attached to the Spirit of God are children of God. For all who have been impelled from within by the Spirit of God are children of God. And so we begin to see this is all something that is, is offered to us. This is a work of the Holy Spirit in us. And it is something that is, is an internal pull of the Spirit. We describe it to you this way. I have never driven by a Krispy Kreme donut store where someone had to jerk the steering wheel in the direction of Krispy Kreme. I never have had to have someone drag me by the arm into Krispy Kreme. I want you to know I am compelled by forces within me <laughs> on my own to walk into Krispy Kreme, especially when it says hot donuts now. I, I take that very literally. Now. I'm turning the steering wheel. I am going. There is a work of the Holy Spirit that takes place within us. God's method of guiding us through life is not jerking the steering wheel of control out of our hands. His, his way of, of dealing with us is not grabbing us by the arm and making us go places that we don't want to go. He has blessed us with the gift of the Holy Spirit that compels us from within, that gives us a craving, an appetite for God and the things of God, to be drawn towards God and to want to do God's will. We can breathe easier because of this internal pull of the Holy Spirit. Another reason a child of God breathes easier. How many of you are just thinking of donuts right now? You've totally checked out. <laughs> you, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I forgot that we have more to talk about here. Anyway, um, another reason a child of God breathes easier is as a child of God, you breathe easier, uh, adopted into the family of God. Verse 15, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. So Paul is kind of shifting gears and he wants us to see the difference between being forced into slavery versus being um, welcomed into a loving home and adopted as one of his, uh, as one of his children. This word for fear, he, um, 
we've not received a spirit that makes us fearful slaves. That, that word fear is phobos. It's the word that we get phobia from. He does not want us to have this abnormal, crazy fear of being slaves. Now, there are times uh, in, in Scripture where, um, where we're invited to be a, a servant or a slave. And in those cases, it's the word bondservant. We have willingly chosen to follow a master. But this word for slave literally means someone who is bound involuntarily. You are forced, um, it's, it's outer forces on you, not something from within you, in other words. And so uh, Paul kind of describes that, and he's, that's not the spirit that God has given you. Um, instead, he is placed within you his spirit, his breath. Um, and so as we, as we think about it in this way, we are understanding that, uh, that this adoption is something that it, it's, a, it's a legal term as we would think of it, but it bestows on us certain blessings and certain gifts. Adoption results in a permanent condition that rests on the grace and love of God. It's a permanent condition that rests on the grace and the love of God. Of God, and this is uh, this is the beautiful gift that He has, has offered to us. Uh, my brother and sister-in-law, who li uh, live in St. Louis, Mark and Cora, have adopted two kids. Uh, this is Remy um, in Cora's arms, and that is Isaac in my brother's arms there. And uh, Beth and I love hanging out with Mark and Cora and Isaac and Remy because it reminds us maybe our kids are a little bit more calm than what we thought. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we love getting together and getting uh, the cousins love hanging out and all of that. Well, um, Mark and Cora, my brother and sister-in-law, they, they go, uh, they connect with other parents who have adopted. Mark and Cora were unable to have children, but we're so excited to, uh, to, to adopt Isaac and Remy. In fact, they just met with a birth mom Wednesday. They might be adopting their, th their third here pretty soon. But Mark is, uh, is thinking, you know, eventually my boys are going to get to a point where they're going to see other kids with their parents, and they're going to wonder, why, why am I different? And, and so kind of with some of the coaching of, of some of the other adoptive parents that have been a little further down the road, my brother takes this into his own hands, and he decides he's going to have a conversation with Isaac. Now, this is a couple years ago. I guess Isaac was about five. So he sits down with Isaac, and my brother says, um, your Uncle Gary and I used to love watching a television show called Different Strokes. How many of you remember that show, Different Strokes? Yeah. And, and he said, it's a show about a white man who adopts brown boys. And Isaac looks at him real funny. He goes, Dad, that's just weird. <laughs> like that. And my brother just busts out laughing and is like, okay, we'll have this talk some other day. You know, it got me wondering that maybe the Bible could be summed up as a story about a loving father who adopts imperfect, rejected children like me. And when I think about that, you know what my first response is? That's weird. But I also breathe easier because that's beautiful. That is a beautiful thing. It allows me to breathe easier that I have been adopted into God's family. As a child of God, you breathe easier, in this third point, focused on Abba Father. Abba Father, this is the phrase that, uh, that, that Paul is using here. And this, is not, uh, this would not be new to them. This is not the first time it's used. In fact, Jesus himself refers, in, in a time of prayer, refers to his Father as Abba Father. Jesus said in Mark 14, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Let me pause right there. This word Abba is a word that a child uses when calling out to his dad, his or her dad. It's Abba, Abba, Abba. A young child, just some of the first words, syllables that they would say, Abba, 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 or from moms, Ama, 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 ama. So, so this was, this was a, a, a common phrase, and it, it had with it just that picture of intimacy between a young child and a father. When, uh, when Beth and I went with a church group over to Israel, um, I was really excited about the trip until, um, until we were flying coach. <laughs> but we, uh, 
But we land in Tel Aviv and we, we get off the plane and one of the first things I heard was a young boy running to his dad saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And I'm telling you, in that moment, the scriptures came alive to me in a way that I'd never thought about them before. This is real. Jesus himself cried out, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Doesn't that sound like something that a child would say to his dad? My dad can do anything. All things are possible. Now, eventually, the child grows up and says, my dad can't do anything right. <laughs> but in that precious moment of Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. And if you know what's taking place in this very tense moment as Jesus is praying this in the garden, he goes on to say to us, Abba, Father, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Um, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, says, because you are sons... In other words, this is descriptive again. God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. You're no longer involuntarily bound to follow these rules. But you are a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. You have been given this gift, this opportunity to give your life back to him in obedience. Now, in this book of Romans and in other places of Scripture, Paul brings up some, some pretty big words, some churchy words that we throw around that, honestly, we, we struggle with understanding. One of them is justification, uh, and that is a one-time and permanent act, kind of like adoption. It is a one-time, permanent act. It's the work of God in which we are declared as though we had never sinned. We are justified by our faith in the work of Jesus. And then there's this other big churchy word that gets thrown around that's, that's called sanctification. Justification is a one-time um, and permanent act. Sanctification is a process in which we are made more and more like Christ. I want to emphasize process. In other words, it's not instantaneous. But in our we want everything instant society, can we admit that it's a little frustrating that we have a ways to go, that we're in process? And sometimes, what, what, if people are really honest, sometimes what we struggle with in our assurance is, why am I still struggling with this sin? How come I'm not more like Christ? When I look in the mirror, I see the same old me. How come there hasn't been more change in my life? And this process of sanctification, of, of uh, this ongoing work, is something that God gives us the Holy Spirit to address in a unique way. And I want to um, describe it to you in this way. At the end of verse 15 and then into verse 16 of Romans 8, it says, Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit leads us to cry out to Abba, Father, and in doing so, we take our eyes off of ourselves. He directs our attention to Abba, Father. And in doing so, we take our eyes off of ourselves. Let me give you an, an example of this. If you've grown up in church, in churchy settings, maybe you've had someone come up to you and say, so how's your relationship with God? That's code. We kind of know in church circles, that's code for, so are you keeping up your end of the bargain? <laughs> you're really doing the things that you're supposed to be doing? How's your relationship with God? We usually answer that with, well, you know, either in a positive way, you know, hey, yeah, I've been, been reading my Bible and praying and been, been going to church a lot. Or we kind of, in a negative way, ah, my relationship with God, it's not going so well right now. I haven't read my Bible in a long time, and I, I don't even know where church is. Um, and, and it's very, can you see how that's a very me-centered response? The Holy Spirit wants us to direct our attention to Abba, Father, and the work that he has done. So now, I kind of rethink that when, when someone with, with very good intentions in an accountable sort of way says to me, how's your relationship with God? Now I just kind of smile and go, man, it's awesome. What Jesus did on the cross is still sticking. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all up to him. You understand this? I mean, this is great. How's your relationship with God? It's never been better, people. Because of, yeah, I knew we had a cross here. Because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, that's why your relationship with God is, is great. 
because of what he has done. And what the Holy Spirit does within us, it takes our eyes off of ourself and it reminds us of the source of our salvation. You need to look at Abba, Father, the one who sent his son out of love for you. That's how awesome your relationship can be. Can you see how you can breathe easier with that? Can you see how that just kind of frees you up to go, how could I not want to spend time with a God who loves me like that? No more being bound. Abba, Father, we cry out, and we are led to cry out, Abba, Father, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And finally, uh, as a child of God, you breathe easier, receiving an inheritance. Verse 17, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. I spent a lot of time this week reflecting on my own earthly father. Just as I was reading about Abba Father, my heavenly father, it, it led me to think a lot about my earthly father. And also, as I thought about um, an inheritance, what do we inherit? What, what would I, and I got to thinking about that with, with my own dad. Um, Scott, you can begin making your way up to the piano and getting us ready for, for this closing song. Um, I want to just point out something. Scott's on his way up. I want to show you something on this shoe that I'm wearing. Do you notice something about this shoe? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's holy. Yeah, it's holy. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's got a, a hole in it, which maybe that's not too weird, but let me show you my right shoe. This is my left shoe. What do you see there? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, I don't know why, but... I always wear a hole in my left shoe and only my left shoe. It's the weirdest thing. Um, I, I never have I had to resole my right shoe. Maybe it's because I spend time doing this. <laughs> but it, there's something, something about the way that I that I walk. The pattern in my walking always shows by a hole in my left shoe. And so as I thought about that, it teaches me that if you walk the same way long enough, it eventually shows. If you walk the same way long enough, it, it will show. So let me ask you, how long have you been walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? How long have you been walking as a child of God? The longer you walk, the more it shows the Holy Spirit assures us of our inheritance and empowers us to walk with Abba, Father. Um, Shortly after my mom passed away in 2006, uh, my dad um, asked me if I would take him shopping. It was one of those things that he had done for 40 years with mom. And as some of you unfortunately have experienced, when you lose someone that you've been with for so long, you just kind of have to relearn how you're going to go through life. And he called on me and said, hey, will you take me shopping? Well, I I told my brother and sister about this, and we were so excited. We're like, great, we'll be able to usher him into the 1980s now. And uh, uh, so we went to the mall, and uh, shirt, tie, pants, we we went crazy with his money. And... uh, and he bought a pair of shoes. And I, I suggested that he get these shoes. And these, I'm not saying these are trendy, but for dad, they were way out there, okay? <laughs> Crazy. And, uh, and so he, he went along with it. He was really excited about it that day. But a couple of weeks later, maybe a month later, he was telling me, he's like, you know, the, the shoes, I, I don't think I'm going to wear those much. I'll hold on to them just in case, but I don't think I'm going to wear those shoes much. And then he kind of laughed and said, you know, you were always wondering if you'll ever get an inheritance when I die. <laughs> You're going to get some shoes someday. <laughs> and three years ago, my dad passed away, <laughs> and I got a pair of shoes. <laughs> and I can't help but think of him as I wear these shoes. This is not an illustration about uh, how I want to walk in my earthly father's footsteps, but it is a reminder to walk in my heavenly father's footsteps. 
And if I choose to start walking with the Heavenly Father now and I keep walking with Abba Father long enough, it will show for each of us. It will show if you choose to begin walking now with Abba Father. There's an internal work that's taking place, but it shows on the outside. When we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit long enough, it will show in the way we treat other people and the things we invest our time in and the people we invest our lives in and the way that we spend our money. When we walk with Abba now, it will eventually show in the way that we treat a spouse, our friends, even total strangers. When we walk with God now, it will eventually show in the way we respond to life's many unexpected and unpredictable moments. Walk with Abba, Father, and keep walking a long time with him. Walk with Abba for so long that it shows. There's an ancient prayer. Um, it's been renewed uh, by uh, the writings of, of Brennan Manning, the late Brennan Manning, and it's simply called the Abba Prayer. And it's designed, it's created to just simply be breathed as a prayer. And literally, on the inhale, you simply say the word Abba. And as you exhale, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. And I want to invite you uh, to pray that prayer for just a few moments. If you've got anything in your lap or around you, just uh, maybe clear that off. Sit up in a comfortable position. Uh, maybe you'll be able to focus better by closing your eyes. Or maybe you need to look at the screen just to to familiarize yourself with it. We won't say this out loud because each of us has a different pattern to our breathing, but I want, want you to consider praying this prayer just on the inhale, Abba, I belong to you because our Abba Father wants you to breathe easier with an assurance that you are his child. And as you breathe that, I pray that the Holy Spirit that is within you will bring assurance. Maybe you pray that and you realize there's still some steps that you need to take towards the cross and receiving Jesus into your life so that you can breathe easier with Abba, Father. But I'll be quiet and we'll take just a few moments right there. Abba, I belong to you. Abba. I belong to you. Thank you.